in the midst of waiting and infertility, incredibly, God shows up and shows off in billowing smoke and lightning. Today, we're going to talk about when God makes a covenant with Abraham, an often overlooked part of his story. Hola, yo soy Natasha Valladares. Eh, nací en Quito, Ecuador. Hi everybody, I'm Natasha Valladares. I'm originally from Quito, Ecuador, and I have been attending this church for almost seven years. I arrived here alone, no friends, no family, nothing. So TDC became my family actually. I found a place in which I felt loved, I felt confidence, I felt security. I remember that the first time I attended a service, it was a guy in, at the stage uh, making the pre-sermon pre uh, announcements and he said something in Spanish. And I was, oh my God, I said, there's a community, it seems that there's a community uh, of Spanish speakers here, so let's try it. One of the most significant moments for me at church was uh, during the pandemic, 2021. Uh, I decided to take the Alpha course online. Wanted to, to uh, understand a little bit more and to learn more about uh, becoming a Christian and living the Christian faith in a deepest way. And at, the, at the end, it was this class talking about baptism. Growing up in a, a Catholic family, I was baptized. I got baptized uh, for my parents, and I said, why I need to do it again? But when I understood the logic of doing this, it was kind of a very important moment to me, and I decided to do it. I, I wanted to follow Jesus' steps and do the same and proclaim my faith in public. After my baptism, I got involved, uh, more involved in a deepest way in the Latino small group. I became a colleague of this group, and after that, one year after that, I became the leader of the group. Uh, our study is in Spanish. So in this space, we can share our, our culture, our customs, our language, and for me personally, it's different to read the Bible in English versus in my native language. So I feel more confident to talk about God or to talk about Jesus and to talk about my feelings in my native language. Uh, sometimes talking about giving can be challenging, in a, even in a small group, even in a group of friends, because people are wondering why the 10% or probably why more than 10%. But what I felt is that multiply it's a way to give thanks to God for all the blessings that I have received. It's not, not only in obedience, but it's also a way to worship God, a way to praise God for everything that He has done in my life. Everything, every single thing that we have, even our time, our salary, our talents, everything belongs to God. So Multiply was a way to, to say, God, yes, God, everything that, you, that I have belongs to you, so just just uh, let me honor you and give you the first fruits, as, as your scripture says. Since I embarked in this multiply journey with church, uh, God has given to me more confidence about how to guide the group. Uh, he also uh, has deepened my faith. He has given me assurance that I'm in the, in the correct way. Uh, being part of the Latino community and uh, through the fact that uh, TDC is uh, in Columbia Heights, in a neighborhood which is surrounded by a lot of Latinos, I feel excited about the idea of seeking more community or, and also bringing more people to church and sharing with them our faith and sharing with them all the amazing things that God has been in my life and has, has done in my life and has done in our, in our communities. Hey, District Church, thank you, Natasha, for sharing your testimony of trusting God during this Multiply season. Isn't it awesome to hear stories of God's provision? For our family, Multiply has been a stretching season, a season of stepping out in faith. 
only to see God show up in miraculous ways. Two years ago, our family set out to give to multiply more than we had ever given in a two-year period. And it was absolutely a leap of faith, and we were not exactly sure how it was going to happen. For me, giving generously is a weapon of spiritual warfare against the enemy's agenda. I see it as a way to demonstrate through our finances that our devotion is completely to God alone and basically kick the devil in the teeth. So, and I have to say, even though we had this incredibly difficult stretch goal for us, God came through in some mighty and miraculous ways. I still stand amazed at all the ways that he has creatively and uniquely blessed us. So I hope and pray that you will continue to trust that the Lord will provide for your every need when you choose to put him first. Now, over the last few years, all I have desired is to have a tangible encounter with God. I want him to show up where I can see him, I can hear him, I can feel him in a very significant way. And I've had beautiful moments and deeply personal encounters with the Lord since I've been earnestly pursuing him. But the encounter that Abram had with God in Genesis 15 is something that I am desperate to experience. You see, in chapter 12, God spoke promises over Abram, and he asked Abram to go to an unknown journey um, to a new land. Abram was obedient, and he set out with his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot. They left Egypt, and they traveled to the Negev. But once they arrived with all their possessions and their livestock, it seemed that there was some competition and jealousy between Abram and Lot and among their herders over the land and their possessions. Well, Abram and Lot agreed to separate and spread out a bit so that they would not fight over the land. Abram lived in Canaan, and Lot set out east toward the Jordan River, setting up his tents near Sodom. Well, Sodom was known as a very wicked city, and war broke out among some of the kings of the land, and Lot found himself and all his people and possessions kidnapped. Abram got wind of what happened, and he immediately called up his men who were trained for war, and they all went to rescue Lot. Well, praise God, they were successful, and Abram was honored. However, we see that even when tempted by riches, Abram remained faithful to the Lord. His heart was devoted to God. We now find ourselves in Genesis 15, where it's obvious that the war that Abram had just engaged in shook him up a bit. The Lord shows up to Abram in a vision, clearly speaking to him, and tells him not to be afraid. They end up having a bit of a back and forth conversation where Abram is basically having doubts about how much he can trust the Lord. The Lord says to him, do not be afraid. I am your shield and your great reward. Even though the Lord is literally speaking to Abram in this vision, Abram still has a difficult time believing God. So Abram questions him some more. God, it's been 10 years. You've not given me a child. So how's all this going to work out? Maybe my servant will have to inherit all my stuff. Well, God speaks again to Abram. And with a lot of patience, without any frustration, God says, I've got your back. You're going to have a son, your own flesh and blood. Just look at all the stars. You're going to have offspring as numerous as the stars. You see, God meets us where we are, and he can handle our doubts. Abram just escaped through the Lord's help, a fierce battle, and rescued his nephew Lot. I'm sure he was traumatized by the experience. So when God shows up to him and tells him not to be afraid, Abram's like, God, can I trust you? I've had some near misses. Things have been really stressful and really hard. I don't know if I can trust you. When I was in my 20s, I can remember thinking, I'm never going to find the one. I'm never going to get married. I can even remember when God brought me to New England to do ministry. I thought, well, I guess I'll be single for the rest of my life because I doubt I'll meet any Christians here. Well, now that I've lived a little longer, I realize how ridiculous my thought process was at the time. But here's the thing. I had literally just left seminary. 
If you're a Christian in ministry and you don't meet your spouse in seminary, then where in the world do you expect to meet them? It felt like my life was on a definite trajectory towards singleness. So here I go to serve in Worcester, Massachusetts, known as the armpit of New England. Now, to be fair, I actually really love Worcester. It's got a lot of grit and personality. But it did feel like there were exactly zero Christian men my age in the whole city. So I'd resigned myself to singlehood. I remember having a conversation with the Lord saying, well, God, I guess it's just going to be me and you. And I started solely focusing on my relationship with Jesus and what ministry would look like um, with only God alone. Because when I looked around at my circumstances, things did not look very promising. Prior to this moment of real talk with God, I kept trying to take matters into my own hands. Now, this was before online dating was really a thing, and there were no apps at all. (laughs) So I doubted that the God of the universe, the one who created the stars, could find me a spouse that would be aligned with my calling to ministry and with my values. Of course, I think it was just a couple months after God and I had this heart-to-heart when I met Pastor Aaron, and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, just like Abram, I allowed my fears and my circumstances to dominate my heart rather than trusting that the God of all creation would come through for me. I had to keep my eyes and my heart focused on him alone. And while I do not believe it is a formula, I do believe that I had to get to a place where God was truly enough for me and I was completely content in him before Aaron could come into my life. I know many of you single people are sitting in these same fears and feelings right now. Again, it's not a formula, but please focus on your relationship with God above all. Focus on trusting him. And here's my soapbox moment for a minute. Some of you single people, men and women, you need to take some risks. Men, pray and be discerning. Then ask the women out. Pursue them. Women want kingdom men in their lives. Now, women, be open to who God might bring you. Joe, Jeff, or Jack may not check every box that you have, but if they love the Lord and are seeking to be kingdom men, then that's a really great place to start. Stay faithful to the Lord. Take some risks and trust that God will lead you and have your back. Abram doubted that God would come through for him. But God kept speaking promises over him. God continued to speak blessings and truth. In verse 8, Abram says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? No matter what promises God speaks over Abram, he can't quite get past his doubts. Now, I do want to point out the beautiful thing in Abram's response, both here in verse 8 and in verse 2. It's the way that Abram addresses God. Sovereign Lord. He says both times, even in the midst of his doubts, Abram is leaning in. He acknowledges God's power and authority in his life. Even though he can't quite see what God is up to, holding steadfast in faith and relationship with God, no matter what your circumstances point to, is the goal. Some of us are sitting in our doubts and not moving forward. Others of us come from a place where we're not even allowed to have doubts. And for others, it's seen as sophisticated to have doubts, to question everything and have a cynical view of things. And here at the District Church, we welcome your questions and doubts. But our hope is that you might have a desire to seek answers to your questions, to seek hope in the midst of your doubts, and to lean into your relationship with the Lord. Can we, just like Abram, acknowledge God's power and authority in our lives, even in the midst of our doubts. We truly believe that God will meet us in our questions, and he will be the solution to our doubts. God is so patient and gracious with us. We may have many doubts. We might complain all the time. We often struggle to trust the Lord with the big and the small things of our lives. But just like in this passage, sometimes God shows up in an incredible way and blows our minds. Now, this just happens to be one of the greatest passages and God encounters in the whole Bible. It doesn't seem that way on the surface. It actually seems kind of strange. 
But God is about to blow Abram's mind, and he might do the same for you too. What we see in Genesis 15 is a theophany. This is a fancy theological word that simply means that God manifests himself in a physical or audible way. You know that tangible encounter with God that I so desperately want? Well, Abram is about to have an extraordinary encounter with God. I mean, God's already been speaking to him in a vision, and now he's about to show up in an incredible way. It's interesting because God asks Abram to go get some specific animals. Without even being given any further instructions, Abram knows what to do with these animals. Genesis 15, 9 and 10 says, So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. So Abram went and got the animals that God asked for, and he knew to cut them in two, create an aisle down the middle of them of sorts. Sounds kind of disgusting and gross, but... Abram knew exactly what God was doing. You see, when contracts, or in this case, covenants, were made, they were acted out. Instead of signing a bunch of documents or writing an agreement down, there was a ceremony to act these things out. The idea was that whoever was to walk down the aisle was entering into a covenant with the other party, basically saying, if I don't uphold this covenant, then I will be cut in two, just like these animals. Jeremiah thirty four eighteen describes this covenant ceremony. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. Basically, if you walk down the aisle between these animals and don't uphold the covenant that you're making, then you will be cut off. You will be cut into pieces, broken and slaughtered, just like these animals. It was common in that day that if a king made a covenant with his servant, that his servant would walk down the aisle between the cut-up animals because it was assumed that the king would keep his end of the covenant. The same was true between two countries. If two countries were at war and reached a peace agreement of sorts, the king from the weaker of the two countries would walk down the aisle between the animals to demonstrate responsibility that they would uphold the covenant. Abram thought he was going to be walking between the pieces, making a vow to God, saying, I will do this and I will do that. But remember, Abram has just said, I don't know if I can trust you, God, twice. And then God asks him to go get these things. Now, what happens next is one of the most dramatic and amazing scenes in the whole Bible. Abram experienced a darkness of terror. A spiritual darkness fell on him. And he was not in the same waking state that he would normally be, maybe like a trance. God continues to make some big promises to Abram as this darkness hovers around him. God says in Genesis 15:13 through 16, Know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Then, as some time has passed and the sun has set, darkness was setting in. Something incredible happened. God has not yet asked Abram to walk down the aisle between the animals. And Abram has not yet done this on his own. He's waiting and trusting in the Lord. And we read in Genesis 15, 17 through 18, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared. A smoking fire pot, which is like billowing smoke and a blazing torch, which is like lightning that doesn't flash away. Both of the words used here to describe the fire pot and the blazing torch are words that also appear when God shows up on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. God's physical presence shows up in the form of lightning and billowing smoke. As Abram watched, a searing streak of lightning appeared and it held its shape. 
God showed up in fire and radiance with billowing smoke. And it was basically like the first smoke machine and light show ever, but it was actually the physical manifestation of God's presence. Then at the end of verse 17 and 18, we witness one of the most profound expressions of grace, mercy, and love ever known to man. The presence of God, the torch, and the smoke passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. God passed between the pieces. Abram knew God was not just honoring the promises from the past. I will do these things for you. God was making an oath and a declaration. God himself was walking through the pieces. He was saying, if I don't do everything I told you I would do, may I be torn to pieces. May I die. May I be cut off. And this is covenant language. It's the only covenant recorded in history where the king goes through and the servant doesn't. God himself is acting out the covenant, walking down the aisle of these animals who had been cut in two, saying to Abram, if I don't bless you, may I be cut off. On the surface, you may be like, Pastor Amy, that's really cool. God showed up in the form of smoke and lightning. He walked the aisle between the cut up animals. He's making a covenant with Abram. Cool. But what does that have to do with me or anything relevant in my life? Well, here's the deal, guys. It's not just amazing that God is the one who walks through the covenant and takes the oath. It's equally amazing that Abram doesn't walk. Abram is not asked to do a thing. God says, I will bless you even if I'm torn to pieces. I will still bless you. Not only will I be faithful to the covenant, but if you are not faithful to the covenant, I'll be the one who is torn to pieces. An unconditional grace covenant. When you look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, when your theology points to Jesus, you see Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, laws, and covenants. So when you look at this passage through the lens of Jesus, then you begin to see the incredible foreshadowing that God is doing, not just in spoken word, but in his physical form, in a theophany. God is manifesting himself in this covenant with Abram to point to what will happen to Jesus. A couple weeks ago, we remembered Good Friday, Christ's death on a cross. In Mark 15, 33, we see that at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Similar to what Abram experienced in Genesis 15, 12, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick, dreadful darkness came over him. We know that Jesus' body was torn to pieces. It was stripped, flogged, beaten. His side was pierced, a crown of thorns on his head, and nails hammered through his wrists and feet. In Isaiah 53, 8, it says, For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. We know that one of Jesus' final phrases on the cross was, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Just like the covenant ceremony indicates, Jesus was torn to pieces and cut off from God the Father. This theophany or manifestation of God in Genesis 15 was God foreshadowing what would happen. In order for the covenant to be fulfilled, the only way that Abram could be the father of many nations and the only way that God could bless many generations was through God himself in the person of Jesus, being torn to pieces and cut off from God the Father. Now you still may be wondering, Pastor Amy, why are you so hyped about this passage? It's incredible to me that the God of the universe, who is above all and over all, would be willing to take on the responsibility, no matter what we do or don't do, to bring about a way for each of us to be in relationship with him. Galatians 3.14 says, He redeemed us through Jesus' death and resurrection in order that the blessing given to Abraham, Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. 
God has written his story from beginning to end of his desire to bless you, to fulfill his promises to you, to bring about redemption and reconciliation with God through the power of the cross and resurrection. There is no other religion on the face of this earth like this. It's the most beautiful grace we could ever encounter. You didn't have to walk through the pieces. You didn't have to go through the, to the cross. God made the promise that he would take on the responsibility for the covenant and the blessing. And he came to do it in the person of Jesus, just so he could bless you. Galatians three twenty six through 29 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. God made a covenant with Abraham by walking through the pieces, saying, the responsibility of this covenant and promise is solely on me. Jesus made a way for that covenant to be fulfilled and available to all people through his death and resurrection on the cross. This is good news, you guys. In the same way that God promised to bless the world through Abraham, God wants to bless the world through you. So wherever you have been doubting God, He is saying, I so desperately want you to trust me. I want to bless you and to bless others through you, but you have to trust me. So what doubts do you have? Where do you need to trust God? Where do you need God to walk the aisle through the pieces for you? I know some of you, just as I was at one time, are waiting for the one. God, will you ever bring me a spouse I can share my life with? I don't want to do this life alone or single. Those of you in this camp might be carrying a lot of hurt, fear, grief, and loneliness. Some of you are waiting for God to bring you a child, hoping to get pregnant with grief upon grief again and again, while watching your friends around you announce their pregnancies and you're sitting in pain and doubt. Some of you are waiting on healing. You've been waiting for the Lord to bring healing. You've been dealing with chronic pain for years, with doubts that God sees you or hears you. You know that he is sovereign, but it certainly feels like he's just passed right by you after many prayers that have been prayed over you. I don't know what your doubts are, I don't know what you're carrying, and I don't know where you most need to trust the Lord. But I know that God is faithful. I know that he wants to be with you in the waiting, in the loneliness, and in the pain. He's a good God, a gracious Father. He's desperate for you to trust him. Abraham waited a hundred years for his name, which means father of many, to even start to make sense. His name had perhaps become a trigger word for him and his barren wife, Sarah. Abram even tried to take matters into his own hands to help God out a bit, which didn't work out exactly the way that he had hoped. Ultimately, Abraham, in all of his years, remained faithful to the Lord. He was obedient, surrendered, and honoring God even in his doubts. While I absolutely do not want you all to have to wait a hundred years for God's promises to start being realized in your life, I do have this to share. The greatest gift and blessing you could ever receive is found in Jesus. Some of us are so blinded by our circumstances, ruled by the ways of the world, and entirely self-focused on our own agenda and comfort that it's near impossible for us to see that our deepest need and longing can be met in the person of Jesus. He has made a covenant, walked the aisle between the pieces instead of you. He's gone to the cross, been beaten and bruised for you and in your place. He's so desperate for you to trust him 
and to be in relationship with him. Jesus wants to be with you in the midst of your doubts and your pain. He wants to sit with you as you struggle to hold his hands and trust him. We live in a broken and fallen world, and yet we have a God whose main hope is to bring renewal to our hearts and our minds, to bring his kingdom to this earth as it is in heaven. So will you let him? Will you trust him even in your doubts? Will you acknowledge him as sovereign Lord, even when your circumstances seem bleak and disappointing? The call for you today is to renew your trust in the Lord. Give praises to him for the ways that he has pursued relationship with you. You are one of Abraham's descendants. When God was walking that aisle, he made that covenant not just with Abram, but also with you. The covenant was completed on the cross and through the resurrection. And today, he's still holding up his end of the covenant. He's just waiting at the end of that aisle with an extended hand waiting for you to take hold of it and trust him. Let's pray. God, what a good and gracious father you are. How incredible that the God of the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, would choose to take responsibility for the relationship with us would choose to take on the burden, the cost of maintaining relationship with us, of having intimate relationship with your children. God, we are so grateful for your sacrificial heart, for your goodness, for your graciousness, for your unconditional love, that no matter what we do, you your love for us will never change. God, help us trust you. In our doubts, in our challenges, in the, the barriers that this world brings us, God, help us trust you with everything. Help us hold your hands, embrace you at the end of that aisle with a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. Let us see that you, God, want to meet us wherever we are. That you're here to meet us in our doubts. You're here to meet us in our pain. You're here to carry those things with us and not leave us alone. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful for your sacrifice. We're so grateful for your generosity and your goodness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, District Church Online. We would love to hear from you so that we can pray for you, connect you to our community through one of our life groups in Northern Virginia, Maryland, or D.C., or just give you more information about our in-person Sunday morning services in Columbia Heights, D.C. It is our joy and our privilege to bring you the Word of God each week on YouTube. If this message impacted you, please just take a moment and share it with someone else. Now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.